Hi, welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. My name is George, and today we're going to be talking about why both causality and randomness make free will impossible. Okay, before we do that, I just want to briefly go over why I'm doing the show and then just give, give a brief description of what we mean when we say free will. Okay, basically, the idea is that um, our notion, our premise of, of why we do things, how we decide, is the basis of our entire civilization, our entire society, and also the basis of our personal lives. And um, the idea is that um, in order to create a better world, a world that's more understanding, more intelligent, that's actually more in line with the way things are, you know, <laughs> that, that isn't, isn't based on, on just a misconception, then we've got to like explore this. We've got to overcome this illusion, this illusion of free will. So it may take, you know, it may take several decades, or whatever. But that's that's the purpose to to try to create a better world by overcoming this illusion. Okay. So what do we mean when we say free will? Basically, we mean that our decisions are completely up to us, and that nothing that's not in our control is Influencing us, influencing us, or compelling us to um, to make a decision, and see that's the key. Because, like, for example, when when you understand that we all have an unconscious, and when you understand that the unconscious is where we store all our data, all our, all our memories, all our thought processes, the way we think, and that every decision is um, is based on drawing things from the unconscious, either words, concepts, memories, and, and the process, then you realize that, well, the unconscious, by definition, is not in our control. It's like, you know, it's, it's just completely unconscious. That's why they call it the unconscious. And so if that part of our brain is actually making these decisions for us, I, we, we, could, we can't claim we have a free will, because something that we're not in control of is making these decisions. Okay, and so obviously what we have is a causal will, um, meaning that it's, it's caused, well, well the, the term causal will actually refers to the idea that like, in order to have a free will, you would have to um, kind of like circumvent causality, because the idea is like that everything has a cause, you know, nothing happens without a cause. That's like, you know, that's like the fundamental process of the universe. So that the idea is like, in order to have a free will, you'd have to like somehow circumvent that. And how could you do that? Because like, any any kind of decision we make, it has to have a cause. We have to be doing it for a reason. And that's actually why we kind of like like to take pride in in the idea, the notion that we have a free will. But that the problem is that if we have a decision that has a cause, then that cause has a cause, and that cause has a cause, and you're going back in time in a causal regression that ultimately leads before our birth, before the planet was created, you know, to the Big Bang and, and all. All right, so let's, let's get into the topic. Um, back in the 1500s, Sir Isaac Newton um, created what we now know as classical mechanics, classical physics. And that was basically completely causal. In, in other words, like, you know, something happened. We, we, we perceived objects, whether there were planets or objects here on Earth then we could like, kind of like um, measure their position and measure their momentum, you know, the direction and speed that, they were go that the objects were going. And with that information, we could calculate their future. We could predict, you know, exactly where would there would be, in you know, for with, with astronomy, you know, when we track a comet through the sky or track the planets, we know exactly where they're going to be at any moment <laughs> into like the hundreds of years, thousands probably, because of this, because you know they they obey this strict causal law. Okay, so um, and the thing with, with with that you know is like the obvious conclusion from this way of understanding the world, this classical Newtonian physics, is the free will is impossible again because everything has to have a cause. All right, so um, it was in the early twentieth um, century that Werner Heisenberg, about 1924, 25, 
and Niels Bohr and a few others developed what is known as quantum mechanics. And, but the key thing is like Werner Heisenberg, a physicist, he published a paper in 1927 um, which des described what we come to know now as the uncertainty principle. And the idea behind that is like at the macro level, let's say we're, we're measuring the, the position and direction of like a basketball, we could like, we could fire photons at it, light at it, and, and precisely, arbitrarily precisely, measure its position and momentum because the idea is like the, the particles, light particles aren't impinging upon the, um, the trajectory, the movement of the basketball because the basketball is so large in comparison to the photon. But when you get to the quantum level, subatomic particles, what happens is when you fire one particle at another to, to get that measurement of position and momentum, <laughs> you have one particle knocking into the other and it knocks it into an, another kind of like trajectory, another kind of momentum. And the, the, the crux of the uncertainty principle is that because Basically, you can't measure simultaneously the position and momentum of a particle. In other words, like to the, to the extent that you try to get the position very precise, then you lose information about its momentum. To the extent that you get its momentum precise, you lose information about its position. Okay? Now, that, that's pretty clear, okay? But here's the thing. Um, then they tried to in interpret what that meant. I mean, the, the, the important thing about that is that you couldn't any longer use classical mechanics to make the predictions because of this uncertainty principle. So what they had to do is they had to rely on probabilities that they kind of like, they, through a lot of experimentation, a lot of um, sequencing and all, they would understand the behavior of groups of particles, you know, and then develop probabilities you know, about them. And, and, and that's, so basically, measurement um, ch changed from being a very kind of like a physical, direct, causal kind of um, process to, uh, to a statistical process of, you know, um, derived from probabilities. Okay, but the problem here is like, <laughs> then, then they began to uh, want to interpret, can I get a shot change here? <laughs> They, um, thanks. Um, they, um, they wanted to interpret what this means. What this means that, you know, like you can't measure simultaneously the position and momentum of a particle. And, um, and what happened was that um, they came up, Bohr and Heisenberg, a few others, came up with what was known as the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. Now this, all right, what they claimed, and, and, and you'll, you'll see the absurdity of it, you know, from the onset. They claimed that since you can't simultaneously measure the position and momentum of a particle, that for that reason, particles don't have a position and momentum at the same time, um, which is absurd. They, they also claimed that because we couldn't see what was happening, you know, because like at a certain point, once we measure the particle, we, you know, the, um, the momentum changes, you know, because of the impact of the measuring particle, then um, somehow the particle behavior was uncaused. That, you know, that, that like the particle behavior at the subatomic level had no causes, okay? And um, I mean, I've read, a, some of the work of Heisenberg and Bohr and a few of the others who, who championed this, this interpretation. And these guys were into philosophy a lot. I have a feeling that um, what they were trying to revive um, was the idea that we, that we have a free will. Um, so, but what happened? All right, so like they tried to make these claims, but the best that they could do with these claims is to, um, to assert that particle behavior at the quantum level is uncaused or random, okay? <laughs> so that, they're, you know, they're claiming that these things happen for no reason at all, for no cause. The problem for the free will question, though, is that if you have something that's happening 
for absolutely no cause at all, it can't be caused by a free will. Okay, you know, if it's happening arbitrarily at random, obviously, you know, it's not um, being caused by, um, by us. Okay, so that's, that's the thing. Um, so, um, so, yeah, so like, there, you know, they, there were some kinds of like phenomenon, and here's, the, here's a very important point. There's some phenomenon like this simultaneous um, particle measurement, um, you know, position and momentum, that um, at that level, that is so, um, particle behavior is so minute, the particles are so minute, we don't know exactly everything what's going on. You know, so, so the idea is that um, they, um, they basically would, some scientists would claim, like for example, with radioactive decay, um, they can't, um, they can understand like the, the half-life, you know, the, the, um, the rate at which a group of particles will, will decay, okay, but for any given particle, they can't precisely predict when exactly that, that radioactive isotope will, will decay, meaning, you know, transform into something else. And, um, and so like here's the, the thing is like with that example, because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, uh, physicists began to claim, well, you know, that behavior, that, that, um, that radioactive decay must be random in the sense of being uncaused. Okay, and um, interestingly, actually, in um, the fall of last year, um, two researchers, one at Purdue and the other at Stanford, came up with evidence that um, solar, solar activity actually influences the seasonal variation of radioactive decay. So, so there's, there's at least one cause. But, um, but all right, so I, we, we've gone over a lot of shows. Um, kind of like describing how causality makes free will impossible. Let's, let's go through it again, and then we're going to go through like how, why randomness makes free will impossible in a bit more detail so you understand. Okay, so if, again, we make a decision, okay? Decision is, has a cause, okay? Um, let's assume it has a cause. Let's assume it's not random. Um, there's a reason why we make the, the, the decision why we choose what we choose. And you have to remember, everything has a cause. Nothing happens that's not caused. Um, there was, was kind of like a religious argument about this many centuries ago that there was a Latin term called causa sui, uh, the cause of itself. And that, that was used kind of like to, um, they would ask, uh, well, you know, if, um, if God created the universe, the world, then who created God? And the answer to that, well, God created himself or herself, whatever. But <laughs> the thing is, all right, fine, let's, you know, let's, let's say we accept that, okay, that, that God or the universe, the, you know, the very beginning caused itself. But after that first cause, everything after that has a cause, and then the best way to, to understand this, I've explained this before, but it's the key, take the entire universe, okay? And you take it, let's say, at the state of the Big Bang, 13.7 billion years ago, okay? The, the immediately subsequent state, okay, of that state of the universe, you know, the state of the universe at the exact next moment in time was the exact and complete result of that first moment because you have like basically the state and then you, ha you have what you have is like these particles there's these gases particles whatever moving through space in time so they move sequentially and then so like you can understand then that um, if you have this one state of the universe determining the next state determining the next state and the next state you take that you know chain of, of um, state by state evolution of the universe you know, causally bring it up to the present, and you, you can understand that anything and everything that's happening now is a direct and complete result of that state of the universe evolution. Okay, and naturally we could, we could also understand this in terms of um, our decisions. When we, we make a decision, there's a reason for it, and then there's a reason for that, there's a cause for that, and we can just 
you know, um, see it from the, from the backward causal perspective, that, you know, if, noth if everything has to have a cause, and the cause, the, the important thing is also the, the cause must precede the, uh, the effect. The cause can't come after the effect. S and so, like, what happens is the cause is happening a moment before, then the cause of that is happening a moment before. And again, if you follow that chain of moment by mo moment causes for the, the various effects, then, um, then you understand how that whatever we're doing right now was, um, is the direct result of a causal chain that, that spans before, before where the Earth was created. Um, all right, so now let's address randomness. Um, randomness sometimes gets confused because um, it's given various different meanings. Um, one meaning is like, for example, and this makes sense, like if I have a deck of cards, um, I ask you to pick one out at random, what, what we understand that to mean is that you're going to pick one out, you know, without giving it any thought, just whatever, you know, you're not going to like count, you know, from, from the beginning of the deck to, to the one you want, whatever, it's just going to be arbitrary, you know, so, all right, that's, that's the common colloquial sense of randomness that we, um, we tend to use a lot. But in physics, um, there's a more precise t technical term that, that uh, many, many physicists will define randomness as that which is unpredictable. Okay, and here's where they, here's where they fall into mistake. Because, um, sure, randomness is unpredictable, causality is unpredictable. In other words, like, to, to have perfect prediction, you would have to know everything about the universe. We, we can make some predictions with, with our knowledge, but, but the idea is like, all right, no, actually, no, it's more so than that. Um, with randomness, um, you can't make prediction, but, but it's, not, it's not the idea that a prediction isn't possible. That's the thing, you know, people say that, um, physicists say that, uh, that unpredictability would mean unpredictability in theory, you know, not in practice. And the idea is, as human beings, with our, with our subjective measuring devices, with our subjective perspective on whatever it is we're trying to determine and predict, first of all, we can't know all the information. You know, we'd have to know the, the exact position and momentum of every particle in the universe to make a completely accurate prediction of whatever. And secondly, because of the uncertainty principle, we, um, we can't directly um, make those predictions, but you know, it's interesting actually. The, the quantum probabilities would not work if the particle behavior was not inherently causal. You know, because you can't have like a particle, you know, at, at its singular level, you know, just being a single particle acting randomly unpredictably, un, uncaused, then all of a sudden, as a group of particles, it becomes caused, you know, because, you know, and, and quantum mechanics, um, the predictions it can make on particle behavior are extremely accurate. It can measure the distance between here and California to hair's breadth. Okay, that's how accurate it is. But, um, so the idea is, like, with randomness, people would say, well, because, um, then they, they would say, like, fine, randomness means unpredictability. But then you ask them, well, what does unpredictabil unpredictability mean? And then that's where they would um, say that, that unpredictability means that, that the particle behavior is not being caused. Okay? And, um, again, it's absurd. It's completely absurd. Um, there is no such thing as true randomness. You have random events generators. Um, they, these kind of like mathematical types of devices that will generate quote-unquote random numbers, but they're not completely random because there's a causal process there. Okay, and again, you, you know, um, when scientists um, claim that something is random, they, I don't think that a lot of physicists understand exactly what they're claiming. They're claiming that, that something does not have a cause, that it's happening uncaused. And, and unfortunately, you know, in physics, um, this isn't something that they go into very much. You know, you, you look to an intro to, to physics textbook at the college level, um, most will not even have an entry on causality. They might have one on the uncertainty principle. Most won't have an entry on randomness. Um, 
it's like, you know, they consider, consider this like theoretical, whereas like most of physics today is just involved in practical applications. But, you know, naturally the theoretical understanding of what's happening is very important, especially as it relates to this question of human will. All right, so, so the idea is like, you know, so there is actually no such thing as randomness in the sense of being uncaused. Everything must have a cause. There has to be a reason why it happened. And again, to the best way to understand that is if anything is happening at this moment in time, it is completely dependent on the state of the universe as the most complete description at the previous moment in time. All right, so, and naturally, you know, Again, let's say there were such a thing as, uh, as randomness, which, which there isn't because it's impossible because everything has to have a cause. Um, again, you know, the, the, the notion of, of free will is like accountability. It's like, you know, I did something um, because, let's say if it's a moral decision, because of the morality of it. Because, you know, because like, you know, I wanted to express a certain kind of morality and, and I take pride in that and all. But, all right, once, once we, you've made a decision and you want to, like, kind of, like, describe it as, let's say, a moral decision or some kind of decision, that's your cause, okay? In other words, you made a decision because of some moral precept, because of some moral principle. Uh, or you made a decision because you wanted to, but then that want is a desire. That desire is a cause. Okay, so, so that's, that's the... Um, the reason um, why both both causality and randomness um, prohibit free will. Now, in physics, um, the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics dominated. It's actually it's actually what you find in most standard textbooks because, as I said, most standard textbooks are written by physicists who've never never delved into this question. The leading physicists of today understand that physics is completely causal, that, that quantum behavior is completely causal. But, you know, I, you know, I don't know what's wrong with the, with the field of physics that they um, haven't kind of like, kind of like, you know, disseminated this understanding. I have a feeling that like, that um, it has to do with the question of free will, that, you know, that, that a lot of people, just a lot of physicists probably believe in free will, although probably, not, well, not so many, I would, I would imagine. But, um, but to, to acknowledge that nothing can be uncaused would mean that, um, you know, that obviously by uh, the consequence of that would mean that, that we have no free will. And so, like, what ha what's happened is since the Copenhagen interpretation in the early 20s, 1920s, um, philosophers have been saying, you know, well, you know, um, particle behavior uh, at the subatomic level is indeterminate. It's, it's random, so that leaves a way for free will. And it's completely mistaken anyhow, but anyway, that's, that's, that's what they cling to in order to try to, to preserve the, the notion. Um, now, what's been happening since, like, f since the 80s, you know, we're, um, Heisenberg and, and, and Bohr especially, they kind of they pushed the idea on physicists um, back then who, you know, quantum mechanics was in entirely new. Nobody understood it. Nobody really understands it now. There's amazingly, you know, counterintuitive stuff that's going on. It's all causal, but it, it's stuff that we don't understand. And so, like, a lot of physicists back then kind of just like, all right, well, if you say it's not caused, I guess it's not caused. And they never really investigated so much. Einstein and a few others tried to disprove them, but they went about it in a completely um, wrong way, actually. They didn't, they didn't focus on the causality of the matter. They focused on the particle measurement. You know, while Einstein and a few of his colleagues wanted to demonstrate that, fine, you can't measure simultaneously the position and momentum of a particle through a direct measurement, but through a proxy measurement you could do that. And so that led to a lot of experimentation. Actually, it turns out that perhaps you can't even do that. But still, the idea is they, they, they didn't take the right approach on this. Since the 80s, physicists more and more, more have come to reject the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. They understand that everything has a cause, everything must have a cause. And it's actually been replaced to a great extent by, by a, an interpretation of, um, of reality that, to my mind, doesn't make much sense, but at least it's deterministic. It's, it's called the many worlds interpretation, that any time we, 
we make a decision, there's an infinite number of, of possibilities that could arise from that decision, and every one of those possibilities takes place in a different universe. I don't know. I don't think that's a necessary conclusion. But the key thing is that uh, the many worlds interpretation and various others that really are, are now more in vogue than the Copenhagen um, are the interpretations that are most um, most accepted, most um, most yeah, most accepted by the leading theorists. The reason I know there should have been several polls conducted, um, where I think in one poll um, the many worlds interpretation had uh, over fifty percent of people saying that, that they believe that was the dominant um, theory of nature, of the whatever. And so, all right. So, so the idea is like in physics, the the um, the change is coming about. It is probably going to take a bit longer, you know, for it for it to filter down because you know this is like you know. Basically, this challenges our very, our very nature, the, the understanding of who we are. You know, I mean, um, we're we're really living we're living in a, an am, an amazing delusion. I mean, and, and the, the the ironic part about this is that it's nature, it's the causal past, God, if you wish, that um, that has compelled us to to have this illusion. You know, it's like, you know, we see some water on the horizon when we're, when we're driving along a long highway. We conclude that it's a, you know, we, we don't see water. We, it looks like water. You know, um, it's an illusion, okay? But, but we're compelled by, by nature. So, you know, hopefully within the next um, couple of decades, maybe it'll happen sooner, we'll understand that our, our wills are completely causal. And, and that randomness, there is no such thing as randomness, but if there were, that leaves no room for free will. All right, I hope you've come to better understand, you know, this, this question of causality and randomness as it re relates to free will. And I'll be back to explain uh, more ways we don't have a free will in other episodes. Thanks.